you may start. All right, uh, are we start now, okay? Yes, yes, go ahead. All right, so thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, MC and moderator for this opportunity and, uh, you know, a little introduction of what we are going to talk and discuss today, okay? And uh, yeah, hi and hello, everyone. Good um, afternoon and have a great Saturday. So I know everyone seems tired, you know, despite this hour, you know, literally the perfect hour for taking a nap, yeah? But anyway, thank you so much for, for your participation and then your commitment to join the summit and... Yeah, also not to forget thanks to our um, organizers, MSGA, for giving us um, Masa this opportunity and for this amazingly well prepared summit. And okay, and then before that, before I proceed to the to my slide later, okay, I just want you know to brief about Masa uh, a bit. If anyone first time here, so Masa uh, actually stands for Malaysian Student Association in Turkey, as you guys see on the social media. Okay. And then we are the Malaysian community in Turkey, which is, you know, the uh, association organization that we take a good care of any Malaysian student in Turkey. And, you know, other than that, we do have a lot of program, you know, um, gatherings with all the students here and then, you know, um, collaborations and many more like. So if anyone here, you know, you guys have any inquiries about Turkey or maybe if anyone here wants to put their study in Turkey or anything else, just, you know, feel free to drop by our social media, I must have social media, okay? Okay, and then um, um, if I'm not mistaken, MC has introduced me a bit, you know, just a little introduction of myself. Well, um, basically I'm just like you guys, you know, a human being and yes, still a student, you know, literally fighting for my life to find my right way to survive. Well, I'm currently doing my master uh, majoring in um, functional analysis and analytics, you know, basically in mathematics. And at the same time, uh, serving as mental health advocate with Young Minds Malaysia. Uh, if you guys don't know, uh, Young Minds Malaysia is a um, social enterprise which helping and providing the youth who, you know, currently struggling with the mental health issues and problems. And we do have a lot of opportunities um, with volunteering and advocating and also a lot of programs, events with exciting topics. So uh, still waiting. So feel free to drop by our social media as well for, um, for more information. Okay. So, okay, so, all right. So basically this pair of sessions here, you know, I'm trying not to be only me talking, okay? Like I will do a little presentation and, you know, pointing out uh, the issues on the topic, you know, the challenges, what can we do as a student's point of view? And from there, like maybe a little solutions on what can we oppose to, to this topic. And maybe at the end of the session, you know, since it's the interactive session, right? So I'm thinking we can do a little engagement with all the participants here, you know, with everyone here to join, maybe join us for a little discussion and maybe we can point more, and maybe like discuss more on this uh, on these issues, okay? But you know, of course, if we have a lot of remaining time, as I know, we only have uh, one hour and twenty minutes, is it, or one hour and a half? Um, but anyway, uh, hopefully, uh, we can have a little engagement with you guys as well about the topic. Um, so okay, I'll be I'll be starting showing my uh, slide here. Wait a second, let me share my screen. Um, all right. So, okay, you guys can see the slide. All right, um, perfect, okay. So, okay, I've been given this topic, uh, post-pandemic education, you know, you know, will it be a better change? Will it change for the better? So before I begin to talk, you know, the main focus of this issue will be more about um, e-learning, you know, online learning and the new norms in terms of education. Okay, so as we all know, uh, one of the most of uh, used terms after the pandemic is the term of new norms, new normal, right? So the new normal in, in education is like uh, the increased use of online learning tools, um, obviously, you know, the mechanism um, of online learning, you know, such as computers, laptops, tablets, and mobile phones, you know, with internet access, a, in synchronized and asynchronous environments, you know, it's become the approach of learning methods. So uh, with these new norms we are living with right now, so will our education change to be a better system? Or what can we do to make it better? Or maybe at least what can we uh, do, you know, to contribute ourselves to make a better future? Like what literally our functions here? Like so many questions we can ask actually, right? So as we all know, you know, a sudden outbreak a, of a little disease affected the economy globally and the education sector has, um, has also greatly been affected. And, ex uh, and as expected, this has expanded globally across the education sector. So a dramatic change has been required on how the students are getting their education due to the novel coronavirus, you know, COVID-19 over in Malaysia. Like. So not only did students have to maintain a social distance from their peers and family, 
but also the students must adapt with the online learning. Like, okay, the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered new ways of learning as well. Uh, so the remote learning has become the norm uh, to avoid uh, you know, the wide reaching and transferable contagious disease, right? So, um, and then on the other hand, so the sudden outbreak disrupted the, the education system worldwide and forced the students to switch to online mode of learning, you know, as well as the um, educators to switch to, uh, to online mode of teaching, especially, especially on tertiary level. So like any programs, you know, including schools and colleges, programs were instructed to be transferred online, right? So the new normal now is a, uh, we, uh, I, what, what I would say here is a transform a uh, concept of education with online learning at the core um, of this transformation. So it is definitely a huge challenge for the universities indeed, you know, as there will be huge changes on how, you know, um, the usual uh, operational work on students' registration, for example, you know, for those who just get into the university, you know, teaching, learning, obviously, what else, research, seminars, conferences, meetings, even the convocation will change, right? So despite these, uh, you know, some students um, are already acknowledged and are ready for online learning, yeah? But however, some are reluctant to shift from uh, traditional learning, you know, face-to-face -face learning to online learning. Also, there's um, there's a study that showed that um, some students tend to detest online learning due to the challenges of personal and technological difficulty is, uh, issues. So we will take a look uh, in more detail, uh, okay, later about this topic, uh, these uh, difficulties, okay? So besides, okay, um, as a mental health advocate myself, uh, you know, working with the organization related to mental health issues, you know, also, also uh, showed me um, that uh, distance learning has also been greatly found um, to be related to psychological impact. You know, it can, uh, you know, it can be, you know, stress, anxiety, depression, you know, negative thoughts, and, and so on. So it is confirmed, uh, I would say it, it is confirmed that um, the existing research, you know, discovered that uh, online learning could give psychological impacts in correlation with the challenging learning process. So while I believe um, in the day two, yeah, tomorrow, I will distinguish speaker from Namsa, we share in more detail about mental health, right? Is it correct? Uh, okay, right, okay. So let's move on to the next, uh, next slide here, okay. So in this case, uh, online learning experience, the overview of Malaysia case of COVID-19. So in this case, you know, uh, the online learning experience in Malaysia, you know, just a quick review, okay. So the Malaysia higher learning uh, institutions actually had implemented online learning start, uh, starting way, way back uh, in the late 1990s, if I'm not mistaken. So if we take a look at the, at the history of ODE, uh, so what ODE means, ODE means uh, open distance learning. So the distance learning in Malaysia and public universities was first, um, it was first initiated by uh, USM actually, Unis uh, University of Science Malaysia, if I'm not mistaken, in the year, in the year 1970, 1971, it was way, way back before. And then it became, you know, more prominent after 1990 when the Mara Institute uh, of Ethnology, UITM, has predicted the distance market. And then, you know, uh, through the time, the online learning demand uh, has been cre uh, increasing, you know, due to uh, capability to reach global audiences, what else? Uh, unique uh, functionality, accessibility, you know, ex uh, as well as flexibility in the long run. So uh, in line with the education and developments, the Malaysia Ministry of Education, you know, MOE actually has introduced um, initiatives in making the online learning um, as an integral component of higher education and lifelong learning. So however, there are actually persistent concerns about the, um, about the quality um, of learning uh, relative to a traditional learning, you know, a face-to-face -face learning environment. So besides, uh, there are actually studies show that um, in Malaysia, you know, uh, has reported students' computer and internet efficiency, you know, and then a uh, personal uh, characteristics, uh, characteristic, you know, such as gender, it can be, you know, ethnicity, cross year level, and then, you know, uh, financial aid status, you know, um, these are the some factors that, um, affecting the students' online learning readiness. So if we did uh, a little drawback, you know, the campus closure and uh, the movement restrict, uh, restriction of their the movement control, the MCO 1.0, MCO 2.0, and, um, and so forth, this has affected the formal learning, right? And thus, online learning as, uh, as the best alternative to continue the learning process. So, you know, and as everyone acknowledged here, in April um, 2020, right, last year, uh, if you guys remember, the Malaysian government has been ordered, you know, the students to return to their hometown and then continue their studies via online, online learning, right? So in here, 
um, the Malaysian government has played an important role in providing assistance by providing the internet allowance to the B40 family, you know, and the students, uh, you know, for them to access the, uh, the internet and continuing their online learning. So this allowance actually uh, basically allows the students to get free uh, internet access for online learning. Okay, so, and then, you know, uh, online learning seems, uh, actually it seems to be an um, effective alternative learning method for both students and lecturers. However, however, there are also some issues that require consideration, you know, such as you know, the limited um, accessibility to the internet. This actually, this seems like a major problem as there has reported, um, okay, I think it's about half of it, like about a 50% or maybe like a 52, 52% of students in Sabah itself, you know, do not have the access to the internet due to the, uh, due to the inadequate of infrastructure. So inadequate online learning infrastructures and, you know, limit, limited accessibility to the internet make the online learning process harder for the students especially in more um, rural and isolated areas in Malaysia. So best, uh, beside, okay, beside the limited accessibility to the internet, uh, the students experience um, difficulty in communicating with the, their lecturers, right? Interaction with their friends, and maybe, you know, laboratory access, which are affecting their studies as well. So uh, basically the major aim of this pre uh, presentation that I will show you, um, I want to focus more on the students' learning experience uh, through online learning and teaching methods during and after the COVID-19 period in Malaysia. Like, you know, the main uh, challenges and factors that affect the usage of the learning system, and maybe a closer look on what solution we can uh, apply, you know, to overcome the negative sides of the online learning, all right? Okay. So this bring me to this slide, okay, the advantages of online learning. So we will take a look um, at the advantage, um, advantages of online learning first. This is just for general, all right? So COVID-19 spanned a bit of break for um, many educational institutions um, to remain closed temporarily, right? So different schools, colleges, and universities, you know, have stopped teaching in person, yeah? So the COVID-19 crisis actually uh, would set up institutions that were previously unwilling to switch and accept modern technology. So this crisis also will reveal the valuable side of online learning and teaching. So like basically e-learning appears in the middle of the summer as a victor. So um, online learning is now you know, applicable, not just to learning uh, academics, but it also um, extends to learning extracurricular activities for students as well, okay? So even in recent months, um, even in, in recent years as well, the demand um, for online learning you know, has risen significantly and it will you know, continue doing so in the future. You know, we just, we don't know yet, can't predict the future uh, precisely, yeah? You know, especially since we are living uh, in the digital age at the moment. So as with most teaching methods, you know, online learning also has its own um, set of positives and negatives. You know, everything has pros and cons. Decoding, you know, and understanding um, these positive and negatives, uh, it will help uh, institutes in creating strategies for more efficiently delivering the lesson you know, ensuring an um, uninterrupted learning journey for students. So what are those advantages of online learning? So as you, go, uh, as you guys see on the slide um, right now, so, I, so here I listed some of the positive side of the online learning. It may be a lot more than this, okay? But it is just some of it, okay? So let's take a look at the first one, efficiency. So online learning uh, offers teachers an efficient way to deliver uh, lessons to students. So like basically online learning has a number of tools of, um, you know, uh, such as videos, you know, what else, uh, PDFs, podcasts, and many more. And, you know, teachers can use all these tools as part of their lesson plans, right? So by extending the lesson plan uh, beyond traditional textbooks to include um, online resources, uh, you know, teachers are able to become more efficient educators. So in addition here, I just, just want to add, the new norm is not just mean for students and learners. We will take a look at both parties, okay, which are the educators and the learners, or even we will include more parties in here, you know, the institution of staffs, or maybe the internet providers, or maybe even the artificial intelligence. I will try to, you know, have every parties included here, okay? So, and then the second one, uh, the accessibility of time and place. So this is just another advantage of um, online education. Uh, is that um, it allows students to attend classes from any cl any location of their choice, right? So it is. Uh, it also allows a uh, schools to reach out uh, to a more um, you know uh, extensive network of students. Like instead of uh, being restricted by geographical boundaries, right? 
So besides, the online lectures can be recorded, you know, it can be archived and even shared, maybe shared uh, in the WhatsApp group or Telegram, you know, for future uh, reference, right? So this allows students to access the learning material at the time of their, of their comfort. Lah. So thus, you know, Online learning offers students uh, the accessibility of time and place in education. So the next one we have here, the affordability. So what is meant by that? You know, another valuable side of um, online learning is reduced uh, financial cost. So what is meant by reduced uh, financial cost? So online learning is far, it's far more affordable as compared to physical learning actually. So this is because um, online learning eliminates the cost points uh, of students' uh, transportation, you know, student meals, and most importantly, real estate. Well, students can save more money uh, instead of, you know, paying uh, their rent or for their dormitory, right? So additionally, uh, all the course um, or study materials are, uh, you know, also available online, right? So that's creating a purposeless uh, learning environment, which is, you know, more affordable while also being beneficial to the environment, you know, and then, uh, since the online classes can be taken from home or location of choice, there are fewer chances of students missing out on lessons, right? So that's also for, uh, this also offers um, students and improved uh, student attendance. So, you know, well, except, except those sleepy head students, like, there's no excuse for them. And then, you know, the last one uh, I listed here, uh, we have suits a variety of learning styles. So what is it? So every uh, every student, you know, uh, every student has a different learning journey, right? And a different learning style. You know, some students are visual learners, while you know some students prefer to learn through audio. Basically, everyone builds differently, yeah. So similarly, some students thrive in the classroom, and other students are solo learners who get distracted by large groups, right? So the online the online learning system with its range of uh, options and resources. Uh, it can be personalized in many ways. So it is the best way to create a perfect learning environment suited to the needs of each student. So, all right, um, online education is still, you know, um, nevertheless, yeah, online uh, education is still related to some stereotypes. You know, people may often think that uh, online students are not smart enough for traditional college or university. You know, they may think that these students are lazy. You know, they, do, they don't get real degrees, they say. So we basically basically had gone through some advantages of online learning above that will make you consider your attitudes, you know, towards um, this type of education. You know, other than that, maybe we can uh, conclude with um, online learning. You can learn whatever you want. Like for example, let's say uh, you're mostly interested in neuroscience. So all it takes is just a Google search for such online courses, and you will easily find the online programs even offered by some of the uh, most prestigious universities all around the world, right? So don't forget that um, online courses actually look great on your resume as well. It doesn't matter um, where your career stands at this moment, but remind ourselves an online, um, online program actually will always look good on your resume. Actually, it will show you know, potential empl employers that you are very committed to learning and you are very eager you know to obtain more knowledge and new skills so from here we can conclude that um the uh, the online education somehow is uh, totally worth the effort so um online courses and degree programs are more convenient and cheaper than their counterparts in traditional education right so literally the best thing about online learning or e-learning is that uh, you know you can learn um in a relaxed manner even if you don't want to get certified you know you just only need patient for learning and a quick online search, and that we take you to the right course. So from that point on, uh, you'll be a master of your own education, and that's it, right? So this is um, just the very general uh, of the advantages of online learning, okay? And then, you know, okay, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world by Nelson Mandela. Well, I just put this quote here, you know, I just feel this quote itself is so powerful. You know, indeed you bring the education with you. At the same time, you also bring the people, you know, people around you, the community, the society to move forward, right? So I'm sure you guys also have um, your own favorite ins inspirational, motivational quotes, right? You know, just stick with it as your motivation, lah, okay? And then, okay, the next slide, challenges to learning and teaching in Malaysia in the time of COVID-19. So the education sector uh, is one that has been most impacted by the pandemic. So Malaysia still faces some constraints with the e-learning approach. It has not, um, actually it has not been legalized like in more developed, developed countries. Hence, you know, the related ministry, ministries have not been, uh, you know, taking this, uh, this matter seriously. 
you know, which leads to poor planning and, and implementation. And then at the same time, you know, um, e-learning has not been fully inclusive. Uh, it can be caused by a fragile foundation of the current uh, education systems. Uh, it may be um, like behind its neighbor country, you know, just take a look at Singapore. And then, you know, these problems actually have also a triggered a new phenomenon that's so-called um, the digital divide, you know, among states in the country and then even among the countries around the globe that has been further uh, exacerbated as urban schools get more benefits and then internet access compared with uh, sub-urban uh, rural schools. So in the Malaysian context, uh, most regions have access to, to the internet and most citizens are a, a technology literate, which can be, you know, which can be defined as having the basic knowledge of handling mechanical gadgets, you know, such as desktop, laptop, and so forth. So what I mean by the technology literacy here can be caused by uh, several factors like uh, the development of e-commerce industry or maybe um, the internet uh, penetration, like for example. Uh, so we all acknowledge that Malaysia was the second best across the Southeast Asia, right, in terms of internet penetrations. But however, the access to the internet in different states is not the same like some, you know, uh, some remote area in Pang, Kelantan, Sabah and Sarawak, they have, they do not have uh, adequate in internet access. So well in here, um, among the many reasons are, you know, the low uh, technology literacy, you know, lifestyle, and then the inaccessible location, okay? So any solution? So as a response to these new norms in Malaysia, so new alternatives need to be devised uh, to cope with the with the new environments like maybe you know propagating mass promotion of e learning of, uh, to society you know and the community it is a fact that this approach uh, maybe is relatively new to the society and maybe it will take some time and effort to get used to it before it becomes a norm so under this new norm you know parental expenditure inclined more um towards um electronic devices as a medium for home based learnings um you know as reiterated by the government and uh, during this moment Online learning, you know, it can be assist to ensure uh, the continuity of stu uh, studying, you know. So through this unprecedented situation, numerous uh, apps for a education purpose has also been introduced, right? As a solution for these matters, you know, such as um, Google Classroom, Google Hangouts, you know, Google Meet, what else? Um, Microsoft Teams and the most popular application that we are using right now, uh, like uh, application through Zoom, right? So, but, but at the same time, there is a category of people that is unable to afford uh, this, um, this, uh, the instruments needed for e-learning, you know, uh, like computers, printers, broadband networks, or maybe even a handphone. So to cater the, you know, to certain households in capability to purchase these gadgets, uh, like uh, the government has introduced class at Roma, right? So which is a, if you guys remember, which is a daily um, television show that is available on the free to view television channel, right? So in addition, uh, the Malaysia government also took some initiatives to provide uh, one gigabyte free internet through selected telco companies throughout the movement control there, right? So, you know, as the Malaysia moves towards a uh, recovery curve, uh, actually more, you know, more research needs to be done on these issues related to e-learning, you know, as it has now become necessary to facilitate the teaching sessions during this outbreak. You know, we, can, we cannot return to the world as it was before. Well, you know, the pandemic is expected to endure for some more years, right? So this unprecedented phenomenon that hit all the countries in the world brings, you know, it, it, it may bring many, you know, possibilities for the implementation of a, of a new normal. So the education is also under SM for this, as the world embrace, you know, and, and then moves towards the industrial revolution uh, 4.0, right? So more, more technology is being used in the daily life to suit the needs of a families due to the lockdown that subsequently you know, caused by, by the closure of the education institutions. So by looking at the needs and then the demands in the upcoming year. So I would say this is the right time for the whole world to shift to enter the phase of human civilization you know, by implementing uh, technology in, in, in daily life, okay? So uh, how can higher education thrive? Post pandemic. So, this is, uh, I will provide some solutions in this. Okay. So, the challenges um, facing universities before COVID 19 have not gone away, but the pandemic has shown that the sector can adapt uh, at, at a pace. Okay. So, with greater openness and collaboration, can help institutions carve out a new identity. Right. So, in many ways, 
Um, however, the past year has you know it distracted from fundamental challenges the education sector faced before the crisis, like maybe including uh, the shift towards uh, the platform economy and uh, you know more collaborative rather than transactional ways of working. So universities, universities, you know, um, must catch up with you know the skills needed to thrive in a uh, in a more network economy. You know, rather than providing you know a, a STEM on the for for young great undergraduates, you know, universities need to focus more on a lifelong learning and maybe you know reskilling. So add to this. Uh, the readiness with which um, students have accepted online and blended learning. And it's clear that universities need to carve out uh, a new role as we are now entering the industrial revolution 4.0, right? As I mentioned before, you know, a more advanced world we are living in. So this is the means redefining their relationship with technology. So how should institutions respond? So they must place um, greater you know, focus on, on their purpose and who they intend to serve. Well, uh, in this, uh, pardon, well universities um, economy vi viability remains challenged you know, due to a decline in international students and also the low return on investment that often comes with research, right? So basically, a moving away from institutional standings and focusing on your public role will build a more uh, a more sustainable position, I would say. Okay, so maybe we can take, um, uh, let's take a look or maybe one example regarding this. So we can take an example from uh, the UK, United Kingdom, where if I'm not mistaken, uh, there's a university, London, London South University, if I'm not mistaken. So this university focuses on um, creating economic and employment opportunities for for its local community. Or maybe another example also in the UK where the University of Sunderland, okay? So this university has built um, close partnerships with the NHS Trust, uh, which is a uh, stand for, for, uh, for the, the National uh, Health Service Trust and social care employees in the Northeast England to, you know, to supply in demand skills. All right, so move on to the next one. Universities must also uh, embrace openness by sharing resources and collaborating with competitors. So this could be mean, you know, working with online education platforms or maybe um, fostering a collaboration with international providers. Well, um, ultimately this will require a, you know, reassessment of business models and how uh, the universities generate value. Um, like for example, uh, I would say uh, one example from, from here, the Arizona State University has launched a research and you know the innovation facility with Starbucks to design more uh, sustainable ways to run its stores and sharpen employee decision making skills. So it is a trend. It is a trend that will uh, will see institution reflect market demands, offering short courses, uh, you know, bespoke corporate learning and stackable words. So through through partnerships um, in in and openness to collaboration, universities actually can create a borderless higher education, ensuring the thrive a for decades to come, right? Okay, so uh, what about uh, the post-pandemic lecture? So this is like, I want to give a big, bigger picture here. So remembering back to the teaching life before the COVID-19, um, in some countries, you know, uh, even in some universities, a few lectures were recorded, right? As well as most students attended the in-person lecture. So since then, a lecture recording has become, you know, more and more common. We can conclude that approximately a half the students attended class, and for those who didn't make it, so the rest just you know watch it, um, the recordings instead, right? So the coronavirus pandemic has uh, accelerated this transition to online content and you know the off-campus learning. Like in the year 2020 itself, you know where most institutions closed uh, temporarily, right? Lecturers, you know, educators delivered the most content online, you know, enabling students to. Um, to progress in their studies from their safety of their uh, their own home uh, or even from their home country, right? So on its face, uh, this a uh, shift to online learning is a good thing. Online or recorded lectures uh, require less physical infrastructure and can be reused. Also, you know, reducing time and cost, and you know, the material can be accessed remotely at any time of day. You know, potentially making a um, a university education accessible to more people, right? And you know, also uh, from the lecturers and educators' perspective, they've all got um, 
they've all got you know also better at exploiting uh, digital technologies like maybe for for example they use videos library to teach uh, to teach techniques in advance of laboratory sessions for example uh, for those courses that needed the use of a laboratory so uh, maybe you know including a uh, screen capture videos to you know demonstrate um how to use software and, and so on okay so imagine ourselves um, as an um, academic personnel. So without dismissing the value of video and online communication, one question that most actually that most uh, academic communities are asking is whether the students will ever return to campus full time. So the proposition to these questions, you know, ultimately a uh, university should fully open where, where possible and then when safe to do so, obviously. And the question here, why is that? So, you know, let's dig a bit deeper. <clears throat> so the second point I provide here on the screen, in in-person lectures um, are more interactive than online talks. So why is that? So, you know, it's easy to think of a lecture as a one-way uh, one delivery of information. Like uh, someone just stands at the front and then talks for an hour, but, you know, actually in-person lectures are more than that. You know, a lecturer reads the room, you know, senses, uh, comprehensive and adjust um, style and content in, in real time. And, you know, when a student asks questions, everyone could benefit from the uh, ensuring discussion, right? So students don't just learn the answer. They also learn how to frame a question in a, in a more um, professional, concise manner, like uh, from both uh, watching other students and by engaging in the lecture themselves. So other than that, Students that show up uh, prepared and intellectually engaged are maybe, you know, uh, maybe one of the job skills that are not necessarily captured by exam, right, but are valuable to employees later. Okay, so, and then this, uh, the third point, lectures are not podcasts. So why suddenly podcasts here? Well, as students sometimes uh, trade recorded lectures like podcasts, like maybe they watch or listen while engaging in other activities or maybe are at least focusing less than they would in a classroom. And if they fall behind, they just catch up by being watching recorded lectures as they would a Netflix series or maybe videos on YouTube channel. So well, um, because podcasts are fundamentally entertainment rather than education, although they can be both, right? So they lend themselves a, to you know, passive listening while uh, you know, performing menial tasks, such as it, it can be uh, cleaning, you know, driving or exercising, right? So what can I conclude here? Um, the classroom, like uh, the routine of physically attending lectures can facilitate active uh, engagement in the subject matter, which is you know, more uh, appropriate for educational purposes. So in addition, you know, unlike lectures, podcasts also make effective uh, use of guests, right? So like many successful podcasts rely on uh, discussion uh, between the host and their guests, right? So the ideas evolve and are communicated through discussion. And it is this interaction um, that often engages viewers as much as, as the you know, conversation topic. So perhaps you know, future, in the future, future online, online teaching could exploit um, discussion between academics as a strategy to drive engagement and comprehension. And then you know, a discussion uh, between experts too, um, maybe it's likely to cut rapidly through the details and maybe to help students to you know, understand uh, the field and maybe where there is, there is a contention and, and uncertainty, but it is again, you know, worth a do over, you know, reiterating that a lecture should be a discussion between a lecturer and, and, and students, you know, and, and the maintenance of this communication link should be a priority, okay? And then the, the last point here, the university experience is more than education. So, okay, um, we know that, um, Recorded video lectures offer you know flexibility, allowing students to watch at any time from any location, right? So, and also if a student is holding any job or maybe um, any family obligations, this flexibility could be uh, an essential for them, right? So, however, uh, university expands a uh, student social and um, you know professional networks. You know, in-person lectures are an essential part of that, alongside clubs and societies, right? So the increased reliance on um, extracurricular activities to build such connections might work better for extroverts for, uh, who are you know, likely to build, <clears throat> pardon, uh, you know, who are uh, likely to build such um, connections anyway. But for many of us, uh, it was the you know, <clears throat> unstructured uh, interactions during a university course or studying on campus that led to enduring connections, right? 
So the pandemic actually has amplified um, how important social interactions can be for mental health as well, right? So a discussion, maybe, you know, a discussion before and or after class, or maybe a, a lecture question that, you know, identifies a common interest, or maybe share the morning about a professor can underpin social networks for students who might, you know, who might be from another city or maybe even from another country. So with life becoming, you know, increasingly fast paced and increasingly digital. So universities might offer one of the last opportunities for young adults to meet face to face. Maybe, you know, the need for on campus education has never been greater, right? Okay, so move on to the next slide. Okay, uh, how to improve teaching after the pandemic. So uh, what we can oppose here, so plans for uh, post-pandemic schooling actually are uh, mostly proving to be ambitious promises and jack up, you know, business as usual outlays. So like from a new counselors and class size uh, reduction to facilities and curriculum projects, you know, systems are really, really busy adding stuff, you know, enhancing facilities and, uh, you know, improving curricula, right? So while these are all good things, you know, largely missing here is what has long seemed to me, uh, the biggest opportunity to improve a teaching and learning is basically rethinking how schools and uh, institutions make use of instructional talent. So, okay, so what does that mean by instructional talent? So when it comes to um, instructional talent, efforts have focused more on adding, you know, allocating, professionally developing or evaluating staff than on rethinking how, uh, how we can better use the talent we have, right? So, yeah, the pandemic is a, is a good reminder that not all teachers are equally skilled at all the tasks they are to do, right? So we better serve by reimagining uh, re the teacher's role so that um, schools can provide more high quality instructions, even without asking each teacher to excel at so many different things at, at one time, right? So after all, uh, teachers perform many tasks in the course um, in the course of the day, you know, like uh, like from lecturing to facilitating discussion, you know, to grading quizzes and filling out forms, you know, uh, to counseling distraught kids and many more. So like no one believes that all these instructional activities are actually equally uh, um, valuable. So figuring out uh, how to let um, individual teachers uh, do more of what they're already good at, at is a powerful place to start the improvement process, okay? And then, you know, the, the pandemic has also shown us that um, it's time, maybe it's time to reimagine re the geography of how teachers teach. So remote learning actually uh, makes online instruction or uh, tutoring in any subject available whenever and wherever it's needed, right? So this means that um, education premise on full time. So in classroom teachers need no longer be universal default. And as we learned this past year, actually um, some, some students and uh, some teachers actually do better when they are aligned. Uh, you know, abandoning the presumption that uh, teacher and student in classroom is the right model for all students or, you know, all learning makes much possible, you know, by offering relationships with uh, far off mentors or maybe uh, simply using remote delivery to provide um, quality instruction uh, to students in schools or maybe communities or each, uh, where, you know, local instructors are not available would be, would be great here, okay? And then uh, it's time to rethink who can teach. So today, um, and nowadays, you know, early early career transients, um, professional routinely, you know, working into their late sixties, um, right? And the prevalence, you know, the acceptance of mid career transitions make it increasingly desired to see education system, like you know, for example, intent on recruiting twenty two years old and hoping they will teach full time into the 20, 2050s. So, well, I would say it's not just this model was bad. It's just, you know, that it's not and uh, especially good match for uh, the realities of the professional labor market in the 2020s, right? And, you know, meanwhile, um, uncooperative licensure uh, systems, you know, bulky licensure systems, seniority best pay, or maybe even, you know, factory style pensions create big, you know, practical burdens and financial penalties for engineers or maybe auto mechanics or maybe journalists they are seeking to enter teaching mid-career, right? So, well, um, practically speaking here, um, of course, you know, any of these uh, retooling job descriptions, you know, hiring protocols, licensure, or maybe, you know, collective bargaining agreements, teacher of record requirements, or maybe even a salary schedule and many more is required. And that, um, that is one reason why uh, we tend to focus on the things that are 
uh, more easier and simpler to do well, like you know, simply uh, simply adding stuff. But either if there were if there were even ever a moment when a uh, change dynamics, you know, animals needs and um, a torrent of cash made something bigger, both timely and feasible. This this may be lah. Okay. Okay. And then um, the next slide. Okay. Critical challenges facing the usage of e learning system. So first of all, the change management issues. So I would say that uh, this um, may be one of the issues that you know uh, touches government policies and legislation. You know, students and instructors. And why is that? So the opposition to change. Um, towards accepting uh, e-learning systems at the beginning of the pandemic is, is an issue since there are students or you know, instructors who prefer the traditional learning and teaching method and may still exist now. You know, it depends on someone's, someone's readiness, I would say, okay? So many students and instructors are still reluctant to utilize the e-learning system. And you know, uh, this explains uh, the resistance among them. As many students get suspicious, you know, about uh, about the learning services process through the system, uh, such as it can be, you know, submitting uh, assignments or maybe conducting exams, etc. Right. So, besides uh, the issue, uh, does not only affect the students but include um, includes instructors who might believe the attention. Uh, pardon the alteration. Um, to be a menace to their occupations when the system uh, gets changed from traditional teaching to a learning system. Uh, you know, maybe uh, the change uh, management should be divided into two approaches. Uh, you know, one purely for uh, change management, uh, dealing with procedures and uh, maybe policies. And another one could be, you know, for the management of resistance to change, you know, focusing on the culture aspect to manage the resistance uh, to change uh, by students and instructors, okay? so. The second one, e-learning system technical issues. So this issue literally could create an obstacle in adoption uh, of the system by many students. So the current e-learning system somehow a, is experiencing some potential hurdles regarding accessibility, you know, even availability, uh, the usability, and uh, the e-learning uh, website service quality. So even though uh, even though sometimes that the e-learning system is designed to meet students' demands, you know, it is obvious that um, when students uh, feel that the e-learning system is friendly and easy to use, then they believe that the system is useful and will enhance their performance. However, due to, um, due to different levels of education among the students, there is an issue um, that some students find the e-learning systems not easy to use. And for this reason, the university is considering all solutions to make it easy to use, la, as this factor, this factor actually plays um, plays the key role to improve performance, hence lead the students to feel its usefulness. And that we could agree that uh, the e-learning system must be easier to use in order to ensure the student's efficacy regarding their capacity to use it, right? Okay, so the last one, financial support issues. So for the bigger aspects uh, regarding in this case of the um, financial support issues, uh, such as the you know, current state of budget deficit, like <clears throat> many projects could be detained because you know uh, the Malaysian government is one of the sole source of university's financial support, other than the investment in research law. Okay, and and, and now you know, uh, let's take a look in the smaller scope. You know, talking about the uh, financial support, some students and families, especially they who come, you know, from the B40 group. So these issues uh, might look like uh, a big issues for this group, as some families maybe can't afford any technological devices, maybe, you know, even a handphone, or maybe a family does have a handphone, but need to share with their, uh, their siblings, right? So this is resulting uh, to the digital divide, as well as urban uh, education availability when more advanced than the rural area, right? So speaking of, uh, speaking about the um, internet accessibility, okay, uh, as I have mentioned before, some initiative that the government had taken regarding this, like, you know, uh, by providing the internet allowance to the B40 family and students for them, you know, to access uh, the internet and continuing uh, their online learning. And this allowance basically allows the students to get free internet access for online learning, right? And then, you know, speaking about the availability, like some families still can't afford um, to have technology, technological devices. So, the government also have introduced class at Roma, right? Uh, like, like, like uh, I, uh, like as you know, I mentioned before. Okay. So move on to the next slide. 
So critical factors affecting uh, the usage of e-learning system. Okay, so first of all, technological factors. So basically, uh, this is actually one of the necessary factors that ensure a successful implementation of e-learning systems. So all technological factors uh, should be taken into um, consideration uh, during the uh, implementation process. Like maybe if the universities or any institutions like um, the technical skills, they are necessary to use uh, those hardware and, and software, you know, the result might be a, flyer, a failure, you know, because, you know, besides um, the physical equipment such as computers or maybe servers and communication networks that must be uh, available to apply e-learning as well as the technical skills and support to the knowledge, you know, understanding and abilities that are used to accomplish tasks related to maintenance and you know, by upgrading of the infrastructure of computers, networks, and uh, even communications, as well as you know, providing support to users when they face uh, technical problems and the availability of the software applications and operating system is, is very important. So this is what is called a, the technological factor, okay? So the second one, e-learning system quality factors. So the current, uh, the current e-learning systems are, uh, I would say, uh, they are experiencing uh, some potential hurdles, um, you know, regarding accessibility, availability, you know, and then uh, the usability, especially for uh, for those who have less knowledge of the internet. So it advised that um, <clears throat> the universities might uh, look into it seriously, as you know, it could create an obstacle in its implementation and adoption by many students. So besides that, you know, the success of the e-learning system, you know, should be measured based on student satisfaction and personalization, right? So it can be accessed from the student's portal and analyze what should be improved or not. So this whole process might need a third party, right? Like, you know, also, also the current system, it's not easy to use by individuals who do not have PC or computer skills, and this will lead to system failure. So there is a significant correlation between ease of use and you know uh, the system adoption. So uh, as students could lose you know confidence in the system if if they find it you know difficult to use as the current e-learning system is not uh, flexible enough in terms of its design. Um, on the other hand, right, if we take a look at the usefulness of the system and whether the current system is efficient. Uh, in terms of its usefulness, okay? Somehow it's related to how an individual um, feels the system is easy to use, right? So what can I conclude here? Uh, the usefulness can't be separated from the friendliness of the system. First, the user itself needs to feel uh, the system is free from the effort in order you know, to feel motivated to use it. So then he or she will try to look, um, will try to use it, you know, to look at it um, from its usefulness, right? So moreover, okay, uh, the current system could be seen, you know, as useful if uh, if the students find it meets its purpose. So well, users will users uh, will feel more, you know, uh, confident in using the e-learning system if it performs the required learning learning activities, and you know, thus uh, they will be motivated to use it in the future, right? So basically, it depends on the students' expectations and you know, satisfaction to. Um, access uh, the system from its usefulness aspect. And then if the e-learning system is set up to be you know, compatible with students' uh, needs, then it could be considered useful and hence adopted and used uh, effectively. So regarding this, speaking how um, reliable the current e-learning system is in, in terms of its efficiency, so performance and security, a lot, a lot of work needs to be done, okay, uh, to ensure that um, the current uh, e-learning system is performing uh, <clears throat> efficiently, okay? So, well, uh, we can't, you know, we can't really guarantee the efficient uh, performance unless it meets and achieves the two main objectives, which is, you know, ease of use and uh, the improved online learning services to, uh, to st uh, for students, okay? So, if the e-learning system meets the students' demands, and they feel it. Uh, they feel it is free. You know, feel. Uh, you know, it's free from um, any risk. Uh, then it can be depended and trusted. Okay. So, in conclusion, what I will say here, 
uh, that the reliability is linked with the uh, system's friendliness and uh, the usefulness from the user's perspective. And here it is important to mention that the current system can be called reliable when it reaches the maturity level in terms of um, usefulness and being free of trades. Okay, so the next one, cultural um, aspects. So cultural factors, what can we say from here is that um, one of the factors that should be implemented to increase the use of e-learning system is, you know, uh, to increase the ICT literacy <clears throat> and the ICT skills of uh, e-learning users, okay? So if we take a look about uh, which level exactly Malaysia at the moment regarding these, since, you know, we are now living the so-called uh, digital age, right? So actually, um, the real increase in the use of ICT by the population in Malaysia is still moderate, I would say, but we will talk a bit in more depth regarding this topic later, okay? So, um, if we, uh, pardon, if the, you know, if the higher education authority can't, you know, alleviate uh, the, the illiteracy level, then it would become a barrier to achieving the strategic goals with respect to uh, implementing the e-learning system. So on the other hand, other things I want to point out here is about uh, the e-society in Malaysia. So if we talk about the e-society, you know, uh, the e-society should combine all educational institutions together in order to, to receive a one entity working through e-learning system, right? So what is the perspective from Malaysia regarding the e-society? Well, we all know that um, Malaysia is now a delivery, uh, deli, deli, developing country, pardon, and it's still a, a developing nation, but the country has never second, particularly in ensuring that um, and inclusive is society, you know? Okay, in addition, the Malaysia education's uh, blueprint highlighted uh, the importance uh, of ICT innovations in schools and then emphasized uh, strengthening the delivery of uh, subjects, you know, especially, especially STEM subjects across the education uh, system, okay? So another important factor uh, is to be connected with the students uh, through, through, you know, uh, different social media, okay? So as it is the main media uh, and application used in Malaysia, right? So we can conclude that uh, the social media is the gentlest way uh, to reach students and encourage them to, you know, to utilize the e-learning system and also let them use e-learning system directly from the social media applications. So moreover, uh, social media actually can help a, the universities to better react to students. And basically it will, you know, it will increase um, students' engagement and improve the e-learning system eventually, right? Okay, so, and then self-efficacy factors. So in order to uh, increase the adoption of e-learning e systems, it is important to ensure uh, students in Malaysian universities, you know, school, colleges, and so on, to have um, high self-efficacy in order uh, to meet the intended, uh, the intended functions. Like, otherwise, it, it's hard to achieve the learning activities through e-learning system if the students uh, show low self-efficacy. Like, like maybe you know, uh, the training, the training programs can you know can play a significant role in ensuring high self-efficacy for both students and instructors, right? And for that reason, you know, universities. All institutions should um, maybe maybe they should create some uh, training programs for them to enhance their IT skills and hence uh, become more likely to adopt e-learning systems. Okay, uh, at today's the implementation of uh, e-learning systems can be carried out smoothly without having regular awareness sessions in order to let students feel confident and motivated in using the uh, the e-learning system. So I would I would confirm that. Um, the awareness is key element that motivates the students uh, to use the e-learning system. So this might help to enhance the efficacy for users, okay? And then the last point about the trust factors. So trust is, um, trust is actually a vital factor to, you know, to increase uh, the rate of um, e-learning system adoption in, you know, Malaysian universities and you know, institutions. And basically, you know, uh, universities are always attempting, uh, you know, to assure uh, that uh, the e-learning system is trustworthy. So, so in order to increase the adoption of online of online learning system uh, among students, okay, it is important that uh, universities are always updating the security system uh, systems to keep the system fully secure for any type of viruses, or maybe to assure that all learning activities are legally run based on the applied policies and privacy laws as, you know, the trust factor. Um, basically, this trust factor, you know, includes 
a system protection, right? And then the information privacy, and then maybe the system reliability. And then, you know, uh, the adoption of e-learning systems relies on that um, software companies that should have the necessary resources to implement electronic services effectively and are you know, more capable of securing such systems, okay? So in addition to this, I would say a uh, lack of trust will actually definitely result into an increase in resistance to adopt e-learning systems. And it's basically one of the, the important trust factors uh, that leads to increase the use of e-learning activities through the e-learning systems projects. And it can, it can surely be secure and free of trade. Okay, so, and then uh, the next slide. Okay, wait a second. All right, uh, digital divide. Okay, this is a very exciting part. Okay, so let's speak a bit deeper about these issues. So basically, the main issue we are going to uh, we are uh, going to uh, discuss is related to these issues. Lah. Okay, um, the digital divide in Malaysia actually refers uh, to the gap between people who have access to the certain technologies within the country. So due to the MCO and all of the restrictions, you know. Uh, MCO 1.0 and so forth, you know, the school closure and, and so on. So some students are corresponding to digital networks or, you know, commonly known as a um, online social networks. And also the online activities are not restricted for uh, social communications and correspondences. So the use of ICT medium for um, online, online studies, you know, uh, educational activities and entertainment is gaining more traction, right? So more schools and uh, more colleges are uh, deploying uh, online learning programs and education uh, applications and platforms. Uh, you know, uh, it's including uh, the use of computers and then uh, the internet uh, to reach the students, okay? So these digital-based learning activities, of course, uh, it will be easier for those who have access to digital network technologies, like okay? So, well, the statistic uh, show that, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it showed that just about half of it, like about 54% of the world's population use the internet, okay? So we can literally conclude here that um, it remains uh, a challenge to bridge uh, the digital divide and it explains uh, the gap between uh, those who have access to computers and the internet and those uh, with a limited or uh, without such access, right? So basically digital exclusion here in general reflects and entrenches broader patterns of uh, disadvantage across uh, age, you know, it can be a gender, social and economic dimension, okay? So Malaysia, however, is not a fully developed country. So this has led to express concern that the limited access to ICT may cause, you know, the country uh, to fall even further behind in the progress of uh, worldwide technology if this issue is not addressed and mended, okay? So the cost of um, internet access um, can be prohibited for low income families, right? And then the infrastructure and then uh, services necessary for everyone to be able to, to use the internet at home is unevenly distributed across uh, urban, uh, rural and some remote areas. So if we take a look at the term digital access, okay? Uh, it's basically categorized into four types. Um, uh, digital, wait, um, what, wait a second. What material, uh, motivational, and then skills and usage, okay? So first of all, a, the material or device access uh, comes first um, as it is and uh, essential to support the subsequent three accesses in harnessing the digital world. So without the possessions of computers and internet networks, it could be a failure in addressing modern uh, digital technology. So, all right. So if we take a look at the statistics shown uh, by the 2020 Department of uh, Statistics, uh, Malaysia's IC use and access data here. Okay, it's basically described the current annual figures of digital usage and you know, accessibility in the country. And it, it also provides a clear indication of households and individual usage of a digital devices and activities. So if you take a look here, household access to internet access, um, internet, uh, you know, it's increased between 19.1% in 2019 to 91.7% in 2020. However, uh, the access to computers as it refers uh, to a desktop or maybe, you know, uh, a laptop computer or maybe a tablet or similar to handheld computer. So even though it decreased uh, just 0.4% from 71.7% in 2018 to, 71.3% in 2019, but it, it's presently increased 6.3% from 2019 to 2020. But if we take a look at the other slide, okay, 
uh, at the other, at the other table here. Okay. So the urban rural is distributed in 20, 20 percentage of the internet users by state and strata uh, showed a wide disparity between urban and rural area. If you guys see uh, urban 75.6% and the rural 24.4% users, right? So we can conclude here that um, the rural uh, people, you know, the rural youth were behind in access to the, tele, uh, to the latest technology and information. So, however, however, the split of urban rural internet users sample here was actually reflective uh, to the uh, urban and rural population splits, okay, um, of the population living in urban areas in 2018 and 2020, respectively, okay. So, actually, these youth need to be exposed to ICT skills during this period, eventually, you know, basically, the percentage of the youth who, uh, who were able uh, to operate uh, computers and had to, you know, had the confidence to perform main computer tasks were basically worrying, you know, and the rural youth uh, who lack the IC skills to become technophobes. This is actually a worrying fact. So moreover, you know, low income families actually are uh, particularly dependent on mobile uh, devices for internet, internet access, so which may not be suited for learning purposes. So the ugly reality, you know, we must accept is that um, not all students can afford access to good uh, digital educations, you know, especially those who come from low income families, right? And, uh, and below, uh, below the poverty line, okay. And then the unemployment factor for some parents has, you know, also further reduced their ability to supply good equipment to, you know, to children in this era of digital education, right? So there are even children who have uh, to share the same gadget with their parents. Okay, so apart from socioeconomic factors, okay, so uh, geographical factors also contribute to the increasing digital divide in Malaysia. So this is um, this is said because there are still many rural areas in Malaysia that you know that have not yet received a good and strong internet connectivity. So this uh, problem will definitely limit uh, the the ability of students to attend um, online learning sessions smoothly and maybe you know thus challenge the effectiveness of um, online learning in creating um, equality in education. So what can we say here? Okay, so the digital divide, especially among students, is a serious issue. In fact, you know, the issue of the digital divide between uh, urban and rural as well as uh, between rich and poor is not something new in Malaysia, right? Okay, so what else can be done? So in this uh, precarious situation, so digital education is no longer a desire, but a necessity for the survival of the uh, national education system, right? So through social media, you know, many parents hope that the education TV uh, show that is uh, is being, you know, conducted uh, by the MOE can further, you know, expand its network. So maybe, you know, the Malaysian excellent teachers are also expected to be able to offer um, their, uh, you know, services to teach through education TV so that, you know, students can, can be provided, you know, with exam and answering steps and many more, right? So eventually, this effort is believed, you know, to fulfill the needs of students, especially those who cannot afford to own, you know, electronic devices such as uh, laptops or even uh, smartphones. You know, add to this, you know, uh, education TV. Um, it can be also, uh, you know, beneficial for students who live in in the areas that do not have a, a satisfactory internet network, right? So the government should utilize existing uh, resources instead of you know, focusing on the system whose access is not owned uh, by all students or families in Malaysia, okay? So in the meantime, the MOE, Minister of Education, needs to, you know, needs to further strengthen cooperation with the private sector. So especially you know, um, telecommunication companies uh, to meet the uh, digital needs uh, among the students in Malaysia. Like for example, uh, if I giving you one example here, so recently one of the online learning initiatives taken for students uh, was launched by the by the YTL Foundation, if I'm not mistaken, you know, a uh, yes and Frog Asia signed the So what do uh, so what do these companies provide to them? So basically, you know, YTL Foundation is offering uh, free mobile phones to families in the B40, right? You know, to the lower income families community with children in public schools and you know who do not have uh, smartphones or other smart devices. Uh, the free mobile phones actually, you know, um, are part of their, if I'm not mistaken, learn from an initiative. 
Uh, right. Okay. And then, you know, in addition to the free, yes, um, they also provide a free SIM card, 4G SIM cards, and then with for uh, 40 gigabyte of data, if I'm not mistaken, and then uh, free learning resources made available to public school students. So actually, these initiatives are amazing and should be applauded as it will assist the uh, B40 community, you know, the lower income group of school and the children's. All right. So on the other hand, so the government also unveiled uh, the economic stimulus package to cushion the, econ uh, the economic impact of, uh, you know, of this uh, coronavirus pandemic. So like uh, the internet subscribers, you know, the prepaid and postpaid get uh, free internet data of uh, one gigabyte, right? So moreover, okay, speaking of this, we should also praise uh, the actions that have been and are being carried out by various parties to help students you know, we can take uh, the example from UEL. If you guys, um, if you guys know, uh, for example, uh, Usta Abit Liu has offered to help students in need for, uh, you know, giving out free Samsung tablets, right? And you know, in addition, member of Parliament of Muar, you know, YB Sheikh Sadiq, who also raised funds to ensure that every family in the district has a laptop, right? So indeed, you know, efforts uh, to bridge uh, the digital gap uh, require, you know, synergy from all layers of um, society, you know, including uh, governments, you know, politicians, and also non-governmental organizations, it can it can be anyone else. We should we should not wait until the issues become very, you know, only then taken uh, action will be taken, right? So if we take a look at the 11th legend plan, so actually some guidelines and strategies have uh, also been reviewed in order to overcome and take actions for the future, layer. Right? So a strategy has also formed um, another inclusiveness platform, which is, you know, empowering uh, communities for a productive and uh, prosperous society. So the main focus area here is the establishment of family institutions and you know the, uh, the potential of youth and development. And then uh, moreover, so to build human capital with knowledge and, and then uh, the skills as well um, as well as the moral and ethics. So this requires uh, a lot of commitments, especially to support uh, inclusiveness and sustainable economic growth. Okay, so uh, so uh, consequently, the government raised the issue of human capital development in you know accelerating economic growth, and this focus area also um, includes the Im improvement of labor productivity and wages. You know, through the shift of high skill jobs by continuous upskilling, you know, and reskilling initiative. So in you know in facilitating the application of high-tech uh, equipment and um, improving uh, technology, you know, the enable innovations in education, uh, the problem, uh, project, um, and what else, production. So best learning can, you know, actually develop a, a, you know, critical, creative and innovative thinkers in, in the STEM subject, you know, in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics subject. So speaking of this, actually the 2017 Bank Negara Malaysia, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the annual report, has uh, once revealed that Malaysia is actually currently and uh, at and you know adapt the stage in the global digital map. And in 2020, annual report ha um, has also revealed that the the uh, accelerating digi digitalization are vital to achieve sustainable growth in the post pandemic future. Okay, so how to reach the front runner stage? So first of all fast and affordable internet. So firstly, the most important part uh, to achieve the front runner stage is, is the fast and um, affordable internet, like, you know, maybe provide home broadband and mobile, and, you know, public digital infrastructure is needed to persuade a more um, digital participation and adoption. Uh, okay, wait a second. I think, uh, James, uh, you, you, have, you have to say something? Yeah, yeah, actually I want to inform. We do have to finish this session um, probably in five minutes time because we do have to go back to the main session. So I do want to reserve um, you know, a few more minutes for the Q and A session for our participants. So sorry oh, okay. to rush you. <laughs> yeah, we're, we are running out of time. Okay, it's okay. I think yeah, the the time is really uh running so fast. Yeah. So actually, I have yeah. a lot <laughs> a lot more to say here, but I want to okay, just one more thing. I want to um uh a point here about the pizza uh pizza result here. Okay, so. If you guys take a look at this graph here, the 2018 Organization for uh, Economic Operation and Development or ECD PISA result, you know, as, uh, as I mentioned before regarding the 11th Malaysian plan, uh, there's a guideline to, uh, to provide a human capital development, right? So if you take a look here, 
So and and before that, why why is twenty eighteen? So the PISA assessment actually uh, usually held once in three years. So basically, since the pandemic first hit in twenty nineteen, so the latest should be in this year, which is twenty twenty one. But but you know, there's still no record for it yet. So I used the very latest information regarding this uh, this. So which is in the year twenty eighteen, lah. Here. So as shown on the screen right now, the focus results stated that Malaysia score um in mathematics and and science was. Uh, for 440 and 438 respectively, which is actually below the OECD average scores of 489. So this is actually categorized as low, but we are still on the track, okay? Because the difference is not so big compared to the last last few years. Like for example, in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, which is reported as 421 and 420. So what can I conclude here according to education ministry, you know? Malaysia's higher education institutions are going to release a considerable number of graduates in arts and social sciences and less so in STEM and te te technical you know, vocational fields between 2010 and 2020, 2025. So this development is considered terrifying as economic activities in the future you know, become more um, digital right, and driven by technological uh, innovation. So these are maybe some of the issues the country must look into to ensure Malaysia is not left behind uh, in the digital race, okay? Okay, so, all right, I think that's all for me because we are very, uh, we have very limited time, okay? I'm, I'm, before that, I'm so sorry for taking a long time to, you oh, know. No, no worries, no worries. Uh, all right, right. Uh, well, since we have, you know, as per mentioned, we have 10 minutes left. Um, I'm gonna select, but we can go for two to three questions before we run back to our main session. So if you have any questions, um, you can use the feature, the raise hand button, or just, you know, unmute yourself. Anyone has any questions? Oh, there. Um, hi, Taufik. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, What's the recommendation? Based on your discussion, I think there are three points of contention that can be used in order to discuss post-pandemic education. Um, so these three points are divided into economical, um, political, and also education. Political is included with uh, industrialization. So with regards to economical, honestly speaking, the strategy that is being working on by our Malaysian government is not effective and not cost effective as well, because one gigabyte of internet for every household, seriously, that's not going to work. And plus, it's not economically feasible as the debt quota in that is actually burdened by our government would not be able to sustain that for a longer period. What would make it much more sufficient and efficient actually is to have more of a localized public, uh, public internet location whereby access to internet would be much more easier. And we can't actually expect students to actually have devices as well, considering the fact that um, some of these students live in rural areas. Now, moving on to my second point, which is on political and industrialization, talking about rural areas, the suggestion is that you should be giving um, devices to these students. I think it's a bit of a fallacy, considering the fact that even if you give um, devices to these students or assistance to the student blah blah it's not going to work because these areas some rural areas are not connected technological wise technological literacy is also what kind of the reason so the thing is this statistical report factual evidences have shown that in like rural areas like for example majority in Sabah and Sarawak could actually be fully developed to match the um, circumstances in the peninsula. However, these circumstances is not met with due to actually political reasons and also industrialization constrained by whatever dogma that is adopted by the country. Which move on to our third point on the educational factor. Now the educational factor can be divided into the student factor and also the teaching factor. The student factor, when you, we're talking about e-learning, though I agree that e-learning is actually very useful. I'm gonna take an example from the Western side of the world whereby rather than e-learning per se, we have divulged into uh, something we call a hybrid system whereby students can choose whether or not to have an academic, uh, whether to have an online learning or whether to have an in-class learning at the same time. And then 
major discussions can be done by students during class, which will be recorded and can be reviewed by others who could not participate later on. The reason being this, some students who possess a conditions or um, say uh, educational dissonance, such as autism, ADHD and ADD, could not generally focus in online education because their attention span would not allow it. Therefore, a full online learning platform is not actually viable and not actually practical. But therefore, a hybrid system is what works best. Now, moving on to the education factor, which by relating to the educators, I think what would work best would be when the educators are able to do their class uh, efficiently. To actually record a full study and doing like a podcast for student, with students who are not actually there would actually uh, discourage uh, engagement. And most students need engagement because that is actually the main factor of teaching. This whole system of educational TV learning will not work because of lack of engagement. If, lack, if engagement is not needed, then teachers are not needed. But the part of the matter is for years and aeons beyond the time of convenience, there have always been teachers because human beings are social creatures. Therefore, they always need engagement. Therefore, I would always recommend this hybrid teaching as well because sometimes students need teachers to talk in and sometimes they need physical teachers. So a full online platform will not work. But like I said, it will not work unless every student can actually have access to internet, which I would say the one gigabyte thing is not working. We should industrialize Malaysia in entirety creating full accessibility to internet, which is actually possible evidence-wise, which is not done because of political and industrialization reasons. And therefore that will be much more economically feasible. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Taufik. Um, well, okay, so we have two more minutes left. I am gonna read out one more last question. I believe um, it's from, sorry, give me one minute. I believe it's from Atika. Um, it says, um, I just want to get the opinion from the speaker, Lisa, based on details of the four-phase plan in Malaysia, schools were expected to continue uh, adapting the home-based learning PDPR approach until the month of September. Um, therefore, sorry, yeah. therefore, um, should schools uh, continue PDPR after September? What are your thoughts on this question? Lisa, you're on mute, by the way. All right. Yeah, I just realized it. Now. Right. Okay. okay. Um. Okay. First of all, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh. Before I answer that questions, uh, I want to uh, uh thanks to Taufik for your a uh, for your suggestion and your op uh, opinions. All right. And then uh for this question, uh what what would I say? PDPR uh should be launched or not? Okay. Uh, should be continued or not? Uh, okay, actually, if we take a look at the situation at the moment with the uh, COVID-19 cases keep increasing, increasing, and then, and on the other hand, you know, the, the students actually, uh, some of, most of the students, I would say, they have lost interest in, you know, education because, you know, as I said before about the self-efficacy and, and so on. So regarding this, the, so the students have lost education of um, education. So, I would say if we want uh my my suggestion would be like 50 50 la. uh I, I want to pdpr to continue because the cases is keep increasing but at the same time i want to you know uh the the students experience the face-to-face -face learning learning you know because um because of the you know uh wait a second because of the pdpr lessons until now i i guess it's it start the pdps uh classes start um in the early of this year, right? So it was take a long time until now. And now we are in August right now. So I think the PDPR should not be um, continued. I mean, for my decision is for 50-50. So because I, 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 I learned that most of the students have, uh, you know, they don't want to learn anymore because they lost interest. That would, that would be my answer for that question. But anyway, thank you for the questions. All right, thank you. Do we have any other questions before we go back um, to before we go back to the main page? Okay, we have um, Abby. Abby, go ahead, unmute yourself, please. Oh, okay. Hi, hi, Lisa. So I actually wanted to know because um, I actually have a I'm conducting a project to distribute laptops to the rural students in Sabah, and I'm from Sabah myself, so. 
Um, actually, um, uh, from what we know, because we've been working uh, closely with the PDP as well. Uh, oh, sorry, Pusat Pendakpiran, the era of uh, the rural area they were helping. So actually, um, the government has um, laptops for them, but uh, I'm not sure why, but it has taken a very long time for the laptops to get to them and um, it still has not reached them yet. So, but I mean, apart from that, we are also uh, helping them and providing laptops for them uh, um, however we can. And, um, and also apart from that, um, the, just like Taufik mentioned, um, the Wi-Fi in the rural areas are really, really like bad. And also if you've seen from the news, you will know as well. And um, also I have had some of my friends who are from the rural areas themselves too. They have commented that the um, technological devices like the laptops, phones and whatnot given by the government is actually not sufficient. So like the thing, if I'm not mistaken, the specs are not enough to for like online learning or like I know in some cases there have been uh, cases that where the phones explode or and like I know one of the cases like the phone exploded and also um, it, it caused the um, house to like burn down so yeah so the family actually lost like their house so I was wondering if you can comment on this and like I guess how we can um, hold the government accountable or like yeah thank you. Okay, uh, uh, thank you so much, Abby, for the question. Okay, um, so you are you basically asking about my opinion about this situation, right? So, okay, uh, so first of all, uh, uh, so it's actually this one, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's need the government involvement, right? So basically, I, I don't know if, if this also uh, evolved the politics as well, but I, I'm afraid I, uh, I don't want to um, touch more about the politics as um, because um, you know it's if it, if it's more about politics I don't have any opinion about that but yeah since you know the if if you guys want if I want to conclude here so so this whole situation is um, more uh, they have like a government and political engagement in this so. I would say that I don't want to give opinion about this, but I think that's all from me, Abby. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Do we have um, maybe one more last question before we can go for a quick session? Going once, going twice. All right, I believe there are no more questions. Uh, Kida, you can go ahead and take our group picture. I think right. I, should, I I stopped sharing now. I, I forgot. To yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. All right, everybody. Kindly turn on your cameras, please. We'd highly appreciate it. Please turn on your cameras. All right, Kida, I think you can go ahead. I'm running out of time. All right. Okay. Can everyone smile? One, two, three. Next page. And one, two, three. All right. Then. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you.